So good evening, uh, students, colleagues, friends, um, family. Um, it's a great honor to uh, welcome you all to King's College London uh, for this special occasion, uh, Professor Lorenzo Zucca's inaugural lecture. Now, uh, Lorenzo is professor in law and philosophy uh, and has been one for some time now. Um, so we are simply catching up with these lectures. Um, now, let me say a few things, but I'll be brief. Um, at least I'll try. Uh, Lorenzo was born and raised in Italy, but uh, undertook his studies in Paris, in Oxford. He returned to Italy to do his PhD uh, at the European University Institute in Florence. That's where we briefly overlapped. After his PhD, he started his academic career in Aberdeen, up north. His stay there was as short as it was cold and dark. And Kings was able to lure him away, in fact, quickly. At Kings, Professor Tsuka has uh, quickly become uh, a scholar of extraordinary breadth and depth, whose work has shaped uh, discussions in some of the most pressing and complex area of contemporary legal thought. His interests span from human rights, law, and philosophy to constitutional theory, with a specific focus, at least in this, his early days, on the relation between church and state. Uh, his first monograph, uh, Constitutional Dilemmas, uh, Professor Zucca addresses one of the most delicate and controversial aspects of constitutional law, which is how you deal with clashes between competing rights in a multicultural society. In his second monograph, A Secular Europe, uh, he explores the place of religion in a secular legal system. Professor Zucca uh, has always tackled in his research uh, the big topics. He doesn't shy away. Uh, constitutional balancing, religious pluralism, democracy, criminal justice, economic order, whether at the national, regional, or international level, whether uh, from a philosophical, doctrinal, or comparative perspective. His scholarship is characterized by a unique ability to engage with abstract legal and philosophical concepts while at the same time grounding his arguments in the realities of contemporary legal systems. Professor Zucca is now working on a project entitled The Uncertainty of Will, uh, which explores Shakespeare's vision on the connection between power and knowledge and examine, examines a, its uh, psychological and philosophical insights on human cognition and human institutions. The book, as I understand it, is very imminent. And in part, tonight's lecture will be based on that line of inquiry. Now, Professor Zucca is also very known for his passion as a teacher uh, and mentor. And uh, many of the students, his students and colleagues would agree that he has a rare ability to inspire those around him uh, fostering intellectual curiosity and encouraging rigorous debate. He's a strong believer in the importance of building communities. This is something that he has done throughout his career. Uh, in Florence, as a PhD student, um, at King's, one of the first things he did when he arrived was to establish um, a forum uh, for discussion, uh, together with some of his colleagues, some of whom are here, Christoph, Irit, Ori, uh, K. Juris is now called, and beyond that. I mean, in summary, Professor Tsuka is an outstanding academic and a true intellectual. Now, on a more personal level, I've known Lorenzo for quite some time now, as we join Kings at the very same time. Now, despite the fact that we were not the only Italians in the faculty, um, for a long time, 
people often confused us with one another. He was called Federico, I was called Lorenzo. Now, I think that um, that may explain, it's only a, a hint, I've never really asked him, that this early and prolonged confusion gave way to Lorenzo's various changes of appearance. Perhaps in an attempt to differentiate himself. Short hair, long hair, well now mostly gray hair. Ponytail, a bun, sometimes a beer, often a goatee or a mustache. Tonight we have a mustache. Now, one thing that I, I've sort of admired uh, uh, him for is really his curiosity. Uh, and not just an, as an academic, uh, that's clear, but as a human being, uh, he always tries new things. Uh, travel is one of his passions. I remember the first, maybe the first summer he had just joined Kings of the Second, um, he uh, traveled to Damascus uh, to learn Arabic. At least that's what he said. But anyway, his travels really have paid off. Uh, in one of his many travels, um, he met Amanda, uh, and they're now a wonderful couple with a wonderful family. And in fact, I see them here in the front row, particularly Gabriel and Sophia. Now, enough from me. Um, Lorenzo inaugural lecture is, as you can see, uh, titled The Art of Navigating Uncertainty, Nature, Norms, and Poetic Wisdom. It explores the fundamental tension between our desire for certainty and the inherent unpredictability of human life. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Lorenzo Zucca to deliver his lecture. Friends, Romans, countrymen, Lend me your ear. I'm truly humbled to see so many of you tonight, uh, and I'm very grateful uh, to see uh, all the people that uh, uh, populated uh, different stages of my life, as Federico pointed out, whether in uh, Milan, in uh, Florence, uh, in, uh, in Oxford, uh, or uh, even Aberdeen. And in particular, my uh, dear family, and my partner, Amanda, and my kids. So I want uh, to tonight to begin uh, with a painting. This is uh, a painting called uh, The Uncertainty of the Poet. Huh? And uh, this painting uh, is particularly dear to me because it brings me back to the early days of school. Uh, and it depicts perfectly the topic I'm interested in. The, this was painted by Giorgio De Chirico in uh, 1913, he frames the problem of uncertainty very nicely. Uncertainty characterizes our past, present, uh, and future. The past in the painting is uh, symbolized by the Greek past and the Roman arches. Note, in both cases, uh, we do not know their meaning. The statue is not recognizable, nor are the Roman arches. The present uh, is encapsulated uh, in the cask of rotting bananas. Even though it's a mundane image, it mirrors the human inability to control life uh, beyond a very narrow horizon. And then the future is represented in this painting by the train speeding away in an unknown direction. It symbolizes technology with its ability to influence the future and make it even less predictable. We do live in a profoundly uncertain age. Uh, climate change, pandemic, war, political crisis, uh, economic, uh, financial crisis, uh, religious intolerance, uh, widespread manipulation of truth uh, are all part and parcel of a picture in which we live today. When uh, we live under conditions of uh, deep uncertainty, we tend to incline towards uh, oracles uh, 
who aim to provide simple answers uh, that pretend to provide certainty. In politics, for example, we put our faith in the hands of authoritarian uh, leaders uh, who claim to have seized the problem and promised to solve it uh, with great confidence. The result is that many people begin to doubt the legal and political institutions uh, and their legitimacy. Uncertainty also makes us doubt our ability to exercise rational control over our lives. It poses a challenge that we would like to overcome. The problem here is that we seek and crave certainty where there is none. And uh, science, technology, law and philosophy, all our domain of uh, academic knowledge are not capable of eliminating uncertainty and doubt uh, and providing us with a certain knowledge. On the other hand, uh, and this is uh, my topic for uh, this evening, art and poetry thrive because of uncertainty. Art and, po and, po and poetry provide a very deep source of knowledge uh, that is alternative uh, to uh, conventional orthodox forms of uh, knowledge. I would even suggest that our blind trust in science and technology at times uh, obscures and tame the power of a creative imagination uh, to find uh, more meaningful solutions uh, to the problems that beset us. The way I intend to, to uh, proceed is poetic uh, through and through. I'm going to begin with uh, creative images uh, or stories, uh, narratives, uh, to show how they can influence our perception of the world uh, and uh, the reality of uh, that surrounds us. My spirit guide um, is uh, definitely going to be uh, Shakespeare for two reasons, uh, chiefly. First of all, as uh, John Keats, uh, one of uh, King's uh, uh, spirit guides, uh, put it, uh, uh, Shakespeare was endowed uh, with uh, an incredible negative capability. That is when Man is capable of being in uncertainties, mysteries, doubts, without any irritable reaching after fact and reason. Shakespeare shows more than any other poet uh, this negative capability. He is capable of uh, resisting judgment. Uh, he doesn't impose a grid of perception on uh, other lives. Uh, and he manages to penetrate someone else's uh, worldviews. Who else could have come up with the characters uh, of the caliber and depth of uh, Iago, Othello, Hamlet, um, Macbeth? It is the example, the illustration of uh, Shakespeare's ability to imagine what it is like to be someone else. There is an another important aspect to Shakespeare's worldview which is encapsulated in uh, Ted Hughes, another great English poet, uh, who says, Shakespeare stood balanced on a knife's edge between myth and measurement, between an old fairy tale world and a new empirical one. His imagination is at home in a pre-rational world uh, and his judgment is perfectly comfortable in the age that leads to scientific revolution. So in this way, Shakespeare manages to reconcile, for a moment at least, uh, imagination and reason. And that is what uh, I would claim uh, is most important uh, in our age of uncertainty. The art of navigating uncertainty, uh, I, I will suggest, uh, can be learned from uh, Shakespeare's negative capability that led him to reconcile imagination and reason. Uh, and I will try to show this in what follows. Huh? First, I will tackle the problem with the certainty projects. Huh? Then uh, I will talk about uh, the centrality of uncertainty in uh, our human condition. Huh? Then I will explain how poetic wisdom uh, can uh, help to give us a better insight on uh, our uh, world. And uh, I will conclude with some remarks 
with the art of navigating uncertainty. So let me start uh, with uh, the stories uh, that characterize uh, this journey. Uh, and uh, in particular, the problem with the certainty projects. Uh, I identified the three different ones. First, Hamlet uh, tells uh, uh, the story of the limits of philosophy. Then, uh, in The Merchant of Venice, Shylock uh, uh, illustrates the limits of uh, the project of legal certainty. And finally, in The Tempest, uh, the story of Prospero illustrates the limits of uh, science and technology. Hamlet, as you very well know, uh, is a young student of philosophy. He probably went to study philosophy and theology in Wittenberg because he was too frustrated with a corrupted and, uh, as he say, rotten state. From the very beginning of uh, the play, the very first line, uh, who is there? Shakespeare exploits uh, uncertainty to the maximum. The play is all about uncertainty. It is uncertainty about the nature of the ghost who is there. It is uh, uncertainty about uh, the reliability of the testimony of the ghost. Uh, can uh, we believe in that testimony? And it is uncertainty about the guilt of uh, Hamlet's uncle, Claudius, uh, whether or not he has murdered uh, Hamlet. Hamlet needs to assess all this uncertainty, but instead of uh, coming to an action, uh, he delays uh, and leaders uh, throughout the play in order to establish certain knowledge through a certain proof. Even when uh, faced with the possibility of acting and murdering his uncle, he decides uh, that it is not yet proven. As Nietzsche would put it, uh, the problem uh, with Hamlet is that uh, he thinks too well, meaning he's too rational, if you want. Uh, is uh, exceedingly rational, and that prevents him from uh, acting with confidence uh, and conviction. His lack of action results in tragedy and a great number of uh, deaths. In this case, tragedy is not due to the recklessness or lack of thought. It is due to, the, to a failure to acknowledge the limits of reason to deal with uncertainty. And uh, Hamlet somehow knows uh, that there are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in your philosophy, is he, he feels that uh, there is something more than a perfect rational analysis of uh, the reality we, we, in search of a certain proofs, but he cannot uh, bring himself to act in a way that is coherent with that. The search for absolute certainty in uh, Hamlet's case, but also in our lives, uh, is a chimera that reason cannot achieve. And when reason goes in overdrive, it loses its power to comprehend the world uh, and act within it. So, for example, when a ruling elite in a society begins to suffer from uh, Hamlet's predicament, uh, we all experience uh, division, polarization, uh, and uh, ultimately a dwindling trust in the ability of public institution uh, to track the truth and deliver outcomes. And uh, this predicament, uh, the Hamlet's predicament, is what I would call the barbarism of reflection. That is to say, when we push reason uh, beyond uh, its own very limits, uh, and uh, we end up in a tragic predicament. The second uh, story that uh, relates to the problem uh, of uh, uh, certainty project, uh, it is the Merchant of Venice. Now, the Merchant of Venice illustrates the limits of the legal project of certainty. Shylock is a Jewish moneylander and he bitterly hates uh, Antonio, a merchant who is anti-Semitic and uh, undermines his business uh, uh, by lending money for free. 
When Antonio is in financial trouble, Shylock has the perfect opportunity to exact revenge. He engineers a legal contract, a bond, to loan Antonio 3,000 ducats. If Antonio fails to return the money on time, the penalty will be a, a pound of uh, Antonio's flesh. Shylock believes until the very last moment of the play that this legal contract gives, me, gives him the certainty of success. After all, the very reputation of Venice as a trading hub depends on the reliable execution of the contract, failing which the international business community in the, the in Venice world would lose the trust in the city of Venice. So contracts, uh, legal contracts uh, and legal certainty back then was just an instrument to buttress trade. Behind the certainty provided by these legal instruments uh, lies the idea that all human bonds, all human connections uh, are transactional and money can help quantify and measure the worth of each of our human bonds. If this were true, then uh, there would be no space for genuine bonds or genuine connections of love and friendship, for uh, every bond would be uh, merely an interested bond, a transactional bond. And of course, uh, we know that the, there are bonds that goes well beyond uh, the transaction of the legal contracts. So the project of certainty is biased towards uh, transactional bonds, uh, but does not even begin to grasp the importance uh, of real human connections. Uh. The truth is that legal certainty is a fiction uh, and it is there to normalize expectations uh, and reduce the risk of transactions, uh, but it cannot eliminate uh, the unpredictability of human relations uh, and external events. The final story I uh, wanted to mention uh, in connection with the problem of uh, certainty is that of uh, the Tempest, uh, perhaps uh, the one that uh, is closest to uh, academic arts, because after all, Prospero is pretty much an academic. Look at him in uh, the gown and uh, the hat. Today I don't have it uh, uh, just to mark my difference. But um, uh, Prospero is essentially the myth of uh, the academic uh, conquering or controlling the world through knowledge. And indeed, the name of Prospero is uh, the Latin translation of uh, Dr. Faust, uh, one of the most uh, defining myths of European uh, culture. The myth, of course, lies in the idea that uh, humanity or uh, the character of, of Dr. Faust uh, can uh, control the world uh, through knowledge that has been achieved through, uh, with a pact with the devil. The story of Prospero himself uh, is relatively simple. And uh, again, it's very close to my heart because uh, Prospero in, uh, comes from Milan just like me, he's uh, an academic, just like me, who is steeped in uh, books and uh, uninterested in uh, discharging his duties uh, as Duke of Milan. So his ambitious brother usurps his title as Duke of Milan. Prospero barely manages to escape on a rotten carcass uh, that carried his daughter and a few books of magic. By divine providence, they arrive at an island, uh, and from there, Prospero begins his revenge that depends on uh, the mastery of the art of magic uh, or science or technology. Prospero's project is to have absolute control over nature and over other people. He wants omniscience and omnipotence. Uh, it is in other ways, in other words, the ultimate certainty project. In the utopia that is the island of Prospero, uh, he achieves uh, the ultimate goal of control of humanity. He manages to have uh, his brother shipwreck and he manages to have him uh, come in front of him. 
that project of uh, absolute control, however, does not bring him any joy or satisfaction. As he points to the unbearable acknowledgement that a life of omnipotence uh, and omniscience uh, would also be a meaningless and empty life where genuine human bonds uh, are impossible as everyone becomes a manipulated uh, subject. Prospero abandons uh, this uh, project uh, as a result. Uh, he says it in so many words, I'll break my stuff, bury it certain fathom, fathoms in the earth, and deeper than did ever plummet sound, I'll drown my book, the book of magic, the book of science. It is the abandonment of the project of uh, ultimate certainty. So once we acknowledge that certainty projects uh, are somehow all limited, uh, then uh, the next step is uh, to question the role of uncertainty in our uh, lives uh, and in our human condition. And here is another painting by uh, Giorgio de Chirico. This one is called uh, The Return of Ulysses, uh, painted in uh, 1968. Uh. Ulysses' uh, story in this painting, uh, well, uh, and in general, well, it is conventionally portrayed as one of a uh, homecoming. It's a long journey home where the hero struggles to for uh, over 20 years uh, and overcomes several ordeals to return uh, in his homeland and chase uh, the usurpers of uh, his land. But this is not the full story. And this painting tells a different story that I would like to show you. This painting is a vivid depiction of uh, Ulysses uh, struggling with uh, conflict, uh, the comfort of his uh, home. And uh, as you can notice from the, the door left uh, slightly ajar in the, the back of the room, the desire of embarking on a, another adventure, another journey of knowledge. Dante himself uh, captures this uh, better than anyone else in the Inferno. Forgive my Italian for a second. Uh, uh, in a very famous line for uh, us Italians, he says, Considerate la vostra semenza, fatti non foste a vivere come bruti, ma perseguir virtute e conoscenza. This translates in English, consider well the seed that gave you birth. Uh, you were not made to live your lives as brutes, but to be followers of worth and knowledge. So in Dante Divine's comedy, Ulysses uh, is in hell. He's a, a fraud because he wronged the Trojans uh, by falsely making them believe that the Trojan horse was a genuine gift uh, to end the war. Dante makes him even more of a, of a tragic hero than uh, Homer. In the Greek epic, uh, Ulysses uh, is homebound. Uh, that's his destiny, his goal. But in Dante's uh, poem, Homer is itching to navigate the sea beyond the pillars of Hercules. He wants to challenge uh, the limits of knowledge. He privileges adventure of the unknown to the warm feeling of uh, the home return. This tragic representation of Ulysses uh, can make us reflect about our uh, human condition. There is a tragic choice to be made between uh, the comfort of uh, home return and the journey of discovery and knowledge uh, towards uncertainty. That comes with the a lot of uh, emotional clashes. Dante's Ulysses is not seeking certainty. He wants to navigate uh, uncertainty and he defines uh, his last uh, chapter of his life uh, by uh, choosing to navigating uncertainty. What does it mean for us and uh, why is it so gripping? Well, 
Firstly, I think that the myth of Ulysses uh, is a wonderful illustration of uh, how imagination grips us uh, and shape very much the way in which we see the world. Uh, myth, the one uh, of Ulysses, uh, speaks to a primitive uh, yearning that we have within us, the appeal of a journey of discovery. And it's that, that is much greater than the life of a sedentary man who has come home. The deeper message of this reinterpretation uh, is uh, the analogy with uh, human life. Our journeys uh, are not meaningful because uh, of the attainment of a final goal. The meaning is given by the quest beyond uh, the pillars of Hercules, uh, the striving for uh, greater knowledge, uh, perhaps the imagination of something that uh, we cannot even uh, dream. Our role is not simply to find something that is out there, a uh, holy grail of some kind. Uh, our, our existence uh, is much more than that. It requires that we engage with uh, life with our eyes open uh, to creative or poetic imagination. Because uh, we have the power of creating our own holy grails rather than uh, pretending that they exist out there. So the journey of uh, Ulysses, uh, I like to put it in positive terms, uh, is uh, best described by uh, the poet uh, Constantine Cavafy in uh, his uh, great poem uh, Ithaca of uh, 1911. What, what uh, Cavafy uh, says is that uh, Ithaca, well, as you set out for Ithaca, hope your road is a long one, full of adventure, and full of discovery. Ithaca gave you the marvelous journey. Without Ithaca, you wouldn't have set out. So the point uh, of uh, this navigation of uncertainty is the very journey and not the end uh, goal of the journey. This is to say uncertainty is very much the horizon of all our lives. Huh? And uh, acceptance of uncertainty is part and parcel of our human condition. We need to accept that our uh, life story is yet to be written, uh, and we can orient it uh, with uh, the use of our creative imagination. I need to say something more about uh, the role of poetic wisdom in uh, this picture because I suggested that poetic wisdom can help us uh, all navigate uh, these peril perilous waters of uncertainty, even if they are also very, very promising and exciting. So poetic wisdom in my account is the ability to transform the world by moving people to follow ideas that are the product of uh, creative imagination. It, be, it can be contrasted with the philosophical wisdom that attempts to make sense of the world as it is. Now, another story that uh, helps me uh, illustrate this uh, idea of poetic wisdom uh, is King Lear. And I selected a passage uh, that is particularly tragic when King Lear meets Gloucester at the very end of the play. Um, and King Lear says, well, uh, wonders, oh, oh, are you there with me? No eyes in your head, no, no money in your purse. Yet you, you see how this world goes, strangely enough. And, uh, and Gloucester in a very moving line that is very close to my uh, idea of uh, poetic wisdom, uh, he responds, uh, well, I see it feelingly. Now, he cannot see with his eyes because he has been, uh, they, has, they have been gouged out. Uh, but uh, somehow he can see better now than uh, he used to see before. So King Lear is the greatest uh, of all modern tragedies uh, in my account. Uh, and at the beginning of the play, King Lear requires a certain proof of love from uh, his three daughters uh, by uh, the means of declaration. The first two daughters, st uh, steeped in the game of politics, abide by the empty rules of this show, 
So Cordelia refuses to play the, uh, the game and insists in being truthful to her father, explaining that he is not entitled to absolute love, but simply to paternal love. So in this case, reason does not prevail. Cordelia is disinherited and King Lyra has to embark in a journey that open his eyes to the truth of the, her, of the heart. The journey of uh, King Lear and Gloucester will reach the pinnacle in the scene I just mentioned before, when uh, the two old men realize that they have been uh, living a life uh, that, was, that was blind uh, to the reality of the human uh, uh, condition, uh, namely that uh, bonds and connections uh, were absolutely fundamental to all of them. And uh, it's only too late when uh, King Lear realizes that he lost Cordelia forever, and uh, too late also for Gloucester to acknowledging his love for uh, his son Edgar. So poetic wisdom uh, gives us access to knowledge uh, of human affairs uh, that is important uh, in many ways, uh, and it is not covered by uh, our project of certainty. Firstly, poetic wisdom requires us uh, to pay attention to the reasons of the art. King Lear should listen to Cordelia as a loving father, not as a ruthless king. A loving father does not need to ask uh, for a declaration uh, of love. And uh, this shows us that uh, King Lear helps us to get to the bottom of a uh, knowledge, uh, what I call poetic knowledge, uh, that is more than uh, a simple rational analysis of the external world, uh, uh, Gloucester and King Lear are in a predicament where uh, they can finally know what it is like to be a wretch, what it is like to understand the suffering of uh, the others, uh, and what it is like to live uh, a life of fear. It is sadly too late and too little, but uh, at least they give us uh, the gift of uh, this poetic knowledge, which is the ability to imagine life for someone else's perspective. As uh, I said at the beginning, Shakespeare is particularly uh, capable of uh, doing this. And uh, this kind of knowledge uh, that uh, poetic uh, uh, wisdom uh, gives us success is neither the type of uh, the Cartesian deductive knowledge, uh, where uh, you start from abstract principles uh, and walk your way down, nor is uh, of the kind of uh, uh, of the Francis Bacon's uh, kind of uh, empirical knowledge, uh, where you gather data and experience and try to build up your uh, explanation from the bottom up. Poetic uh, wisdom also gives us access to a different type of language, uh, and this is uh, another important point. Uh, it is a poetic language uh, that provides us with an uh, insight, uh, and it is opposed to the sort of uh, instrumental language uh, that is part and parcel of uh, our uh, rational endeavors. So when you think of uh, poetry that touches you or make you move in a certain emotional direction, uh, you not only can see an image uh, of a forest, of, uh, of a beautiful scenery, or uh, a loved one, but uh, you can feel it uh, through the means of uh, poetic language. So poetic language uh, gives you an insight into that experience uh, and uh, it makes you present to that experience. Uh, something, of course, that ordinary instrumental language cannot achieve. Poetic language does that by creating images and symbols uh, that 
are central to human understanding. And the final aspects uh, of poetic wisdom that I wanted to highlight uh, is that poetic uh, wisdom uh, gives us a better understanding of the relationship between uh, reason uh, and imagination. Now, poetic wisdom uh, allows us uh, to see that sometimes uh, we cannot allow reason to control imagination. Philosophy indeed attempts to control imagination and, uh, and very often from uh, Plato to our days, uh, it, kept to, it tried to keep uh, imagination outside of uh, the walls of the Republic. Uh, but reason alone, we can uh, see it very well today in today's world, is not capable of uh, leading us toward never-ending progress in uh, understanding. There is a conflict between uh, reason and imagination. Uh, uh, the two point uh, in different direction. Uh, it is not difficult to see why uh, the two outlooks might be in attention. Imagination uh, does not aim to respond to what is there. It might even blur that picture and make it more difficult to apprehend uh, reality rationally. Rather than uh, dispelling that conflict altogether, I prefer to offer a genealogical account of the relationship between uh, uh, reason and imagination. Inspired by Giambattista Vico, who is one of the greatest Italian philosophers, uh, who was uh, the first to provide an account of uh, poetic wisdom. For uh, Vico, poetic wisdom, uh, what he calls a sapienza poetica, is a form of uh, primitive uh, imaginative knowledge uh, that was essential to early human societies. He argued that poetic wisdom uh, reflects an instinctive, uh, symbolic way of understanding the world, uh, driven by myth, metaphor, and the senses rather than by rational scientific thought. In uh, Vico's view, early humans could not think abstractly. So they, just like uh, very, very, very young children. So they projected human qualities and emotions uh, onto natural phenomena, creating myths, gods, to explain the world around them. This form of wisdom, uh, found also uh, among other things in uh, epic poetry, encapsulated the collective cultural experiences and conveyed social truths that helped to bind uh, the communities together. And these, these myths, these stories uh, are part and parcels uh, of who we are. They cannot be detached from our uh, human uh, story. Vico thought that human imagination uh, is at its peak when societies are in a primitive stage, the explanation of the world work is naturally much more creative in these early stages. And as the society progresses, creative imagination becomes more and more tamed and reason becomes more prominent. So we have a cycle that goes from the age of gods to the age of heroes, to the age of uh, humans, uh, a cycle that moves uh, relentlessly from uh, imagination uh, all the way to reason, and then back again uh, to the age of reason. So my hunch is uh, that nowadays uh, we are at the end of uh, the age of reason, uh, and uh, we are moving towards a more barbarous age. This could be interpreted as uh, a sign of uh, despair, but uh, I'd like to say something that uh, would try to lessen uh, this blow, at least, uh, or perhaps uh, to try and uh, reconcile uh, imagination and reason, uh, which is exactly what I think should be our uh, task today. 
And uh, I'll do it in my conclusive uh, thoughts uh, that ends the journey. So when I uh, try to sum up what is the art of uh, navigating uncertainty, I uh, can think of uh, three different uh, lessons. Uh. The first uh, lesson, which I associate with uh, Hamlet, uh, is that we must learn from Hamlet. We cannot wait for absolute certainty to act in the world. A life uh, well lived uh, will uh, always uh, be a risky journey that begins with action and is oriented towards uh, knowledge, like in the case of Ulysses. Even if a fundamental part of it is the acceptance of an uncertainty. So I want to be clear, uncertainty in my picture is the precondition of our freedom. It gives us uh, the power to create our life anew and to really dive into our uh, freedom uh, to imagine. The second uh, lesson uh, I draw from uh, this journey is um, that our legal and political institutions uh, do need uh, more than ever creative narratives, uh, creative imagination uh, to buttress the lack or decline of legitimacy in the face of uncertainty. This is particularly important when societies uh, are polarized uh, and therefore incapable to see reason uh, from the other side. So think of uh, Trump America. There was no point to try and uh, convince the other side uh, by the use of reason that Trump would not be a good candidate for a country. There was no point in using rational argument uh, to meet the opponent. Uh, what was needed uh, was uh, a set of narratives, uh, stories uh, that could move uh, us all to act for the right reasons. So philosophy, science, technology all need these narratives uh, to explain the role of uncertainty in uh, our lives. And I come to the last point, uh, which is, uh, which has to do with, uh, more specifically with uh, Prospero and the Tempest. Uh. Science and technology suffer from uh, several problems of trust uh, in the age of uncertainty. You can think of uh, the example of uh, COVID and uh, the reception of uh, COVID vaccines, how so many people pushed against uh, scientific evidence uh, because um, they thought that there was a, a plot behind it. You can also think of uh, artificial intelligence, uh, for example, and uh, its ability, inability to acknowledge the role of uncertainty. When artificial intelligence speaks, he speaks with the highest possible confidence. Sure, it is the fruit of uh, uh, aggregating statistical probabilities, but uh, artificial intelligence never acknowledges the fundamental role of uncertainty in uh, its pronouncements. Our societies uh, need to delve more deeply into these imaginative narratives uh, to explain and communicate the role of, of uncertainty in expert decision making. Whether the decision is a human decision or, or an algorithmic decision. Like Prospero, we should give up the myth of absolute control and insist that science itself works against a background of uncertainty. So what is this art of navigating uncertainty, it, I try to defend in uh, this lecture the idea that it is all about nurturing our ability to imagine a better future and act to make it come true. Thank you very much for your attention.
Oh, that was amazing, Lorenzo. Um, you can see how Shakespeare has become Lorenzo's latest uh, love, for example, but uh, really quite impressive. Now, no questions allowed. This is tradition in an inaugural lecture. Um, Lorenzo is very happy about that, but there are drinks. That's also another tradition that we have to uphold. Uh, and I'm sure he'll be willing to explore some of those um, sort of uh, findings at the end with you of the drinks. But let me for now thank uh, Lorenzo and, and all of you uh, for coming to his inaugural lecture. And uh, let's, let's uh, have a drink.